This topic is, you know, about the uh, a book I published back in uh, May called Vintage Baseball's Enduring Legacy. It sounds like a few of you are familiar with vintage baseball. I know there's a very strong scene in central Illinois and uh, Danville and in, uh, Springfield and Decatur and, and so forth. So, um, you know, if you've seen it or checked it out, um, hopefully I can kind of explain what you saw a little bit and uh, answer the question and hopefully continue to kind of spread the word about this uh, really hidden gem and, and, and essential piece of Americana. So. Uh, without further ado, I'll get into myself a little bit. So, like I said, uh, university professor uh, in business, not in, not in baseball history, unfortunately, but uh, we all we all have. I was kind of thought it was a juxtaposition being a technologist pursuing all things new, but also you know, in a hobby that's 150 plus years old. But I guess that keeps me rounded. And so, um, you know, again, I've been a, been a state member out of St. Louis, um, diehard Cardinals fan, even this year. <laughs> To get older for about uh, for about a decade outside up by the bleachers uh, during the good years. So you know I love baseball in all forms. You know uh, uh, obviously the modern major league. Uh, you know despite all its complexities and differences from the earlier game, but uh, you know definitely appreciate both. If you love baseball, you appreciate it in all forms. So uh, not much a ball player myself. Uh, you know I have uh, made some cameos in vintage games, uh, but again you know I uh, my competitive career ended at twelve. I'm I'm definitely a zero two player, but uh, love that claim. Yep, yep, but definitely, uh, definitely a, uh, a, a historian fan of the game, and uh, you know you don't have to be a player to to love baseball. So, um, but yeah, how how did I learn about vintage baseball? So, uh, if you're familiar with St. Louis, there's a a park about two miles from Bush Stadium called uh, Lafayette Park, and it's really the first uh, urban park west of the Mississippi, founded around the uh, 1840s or so, and um, you know the site is basically meticulously preserved. It's a, on the National Register of Historic Places. Uh, really looks exactly like it was in the 1800s. It's surrounded by these gorgeous Victorian row houses uh, that that folks have come in and bought and restored to their original grandeur. And uh, this 30-acre park um, was really the uh, the site of the first organized club in the St. Louis area called the uh, called the Cyclone. They unfortunately only played for a year before, of course, the Civil War broke that up and actually saw teammates on opposite sides of of, of the battlefield at uh, at Vicksburg. So I'll get into that in a little bit, but. Uh, you know that the area has has great significance into St. Louis's baseball history and is at home to uh, uh, to the St. Louis uh, Cyclone Baseball Club today that play uh, vintage style and actually got to uh, got to meet up with them at the St. Louis Cup vintage event uh, a couple weeks ago. So uh, they're they're still continuing that legacy of their of their predecessors from 1860. And like I said, published the book uh, back in uh, May. Um, which before I forget, uh, it is available um, on uh, Amazon in an ebook. As well as uh, um, in, in, in paperback, uh, the publisher is Poco Press. Uh, if you've read, if you're familiar with Jay Thomas Hetrick, he's a, a baseball his, history writer himself. He's written some great books. Uh, one of which on uh, the 1899 Cleveland Spiders. Uh, if you're familiar, they are basically the worst team of all time. They went uh, 20 and 134, um, and he writes an excellent piece on that. So recommend checking that out. Uh, also did a piece on Chris Fondera, the founder of the. St. Louis Browns, um, and really the uh, reason why we're able to to enjoy uh, alcoholic beverages at baseball games and play games on Sunday uh, when, when he started uh, the Brown Stockings and they played in the uh, American Association, the, the old beer and whiskey league of the 1880s. So uh, he was on the Hall of Fame ballot, fell well short many years ago, but, uh, you know, definitely a, a, a renowned name in, in, in baseball history. Any questions before I jump into kind of the book or the presentation? No, but I'll let everyone know there are links to buy the book posted on Facebook and on Twitter. So if you're looking for them, we haven't posted. Very good. Um, so I thought just a little bit uh, into the book, um, you know, I, I like to call it, it's really it's really 19th century baseball then and now. So what do I mean by that? It's uh, really divided into three parts. So part one is kind of a, um, a history of the uh, of baseball's pioneer era, circa 1840 to 1870, where it really emerged from a you know, niche hobby among New Yorkers. Uh, to to America's game, thanks largely to the uh, to the Civil War. So, you know, without getting into all the details, we get into some of those formative events between the Civil War. Um, we get into you know Doc Adams and the Knickerbocker Baseball Club and their you know initial publication of rules around 1845. Um, we even get into some of the uh, apocryphal myths of uh, Abner Doubleday, who never claimed to have invented baseball. It was really just a Albert Spaulding, uh, uh, you know, ploy to, uh, to to sell baseball as an American game and kind of stick it to his English colleague, Henry Chadwick. Uh, but, you know, again, I won't, uh, won't steal my own thunder there. Uh, but again, that myth is very important. I equate it to George Washington, the cherry tree, right? It's a myth, but we, we continue to adopt it because it's important to, uh, to help us understand kind of how, uh, 
how a Civil War hero became a symbol of, a, of, of an American game and helped it, you know, grow in popularity thereafter. Um, and then part two is kind of, so you think about vintage baseball, we're, we're trying to recreate that era. You know, most of the clubs play by 1860, 1864 rules, and I'll get into what those rules really are. Um, and then, you know, these vintage baseball leagues didn't really resurface until about 1979 in, in Long Island, New York, in the old Bethpage Village restoration. Uh, it's, a, it's a historical village um, that, uh, you know, was basically some Civil War reenactors that uh, got tired of the fixed outcome. So they, uh, they created this, uh, this, this uh, historical game to, to uh, you know, recreate it, but also, um, you know, have, have, have the baseball be real because that was, that was very much part of the, of the sentiment of that era. So, uh, but, you know, in that 110 year gap between when this pioneer era ended and when vintage baseball started, what happened with the game? Well, a lot, you know, short of going into 110 years of baseball history over about 50 pages, I just get into some of the, I'll call it seismic shifts in the game, um, whether it's, you know, scandals, like we talk about, you know, the Louisville Grays, one of the high profile um, uh, gambling scandals of the 1870s to, of course, the Black Sox in, in 1919. And then just some of the just commercialization of, of modern baseball. You know, we, we get into uh, Flood v. Coon and, and free agency in the 1970s. Um, we get into analytics and the Moneyball Revolution and some of the complexities that 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 that, that has added uh, to the modern game. And we even get into some of the modern technological scandals like uh, uh, Hackgate involving my beloved St. Louis Cardinals and uh, and and former executive Jeff Lunau with the Houston Astros, and then again with the Astros and um, and uh, uh, the code breaker sign stealing scandal. So, just really talks about how the game has commercialized, evolved, adapted, really to to grow into this eleven billion dollar empire that it is today. Uh, but not without a share of drawbacks. Um, so, you know, some of those have 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 motivated some to kind of rekindle this game in its pure 19th century form. Um, so a little bit of that that section is 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 devoted to that. And then part three really dives into this vintage baseball revival. I talked a little bit about its humble origins in Long Island. It kind of had a simultaneous start in, in Columbus, Ohio, um, and has really grown to over 400 clubs across the country today. Uh, they play by various different eras. There is a, uh, a vintage baseball association. They have a website, vbba.org. I encourage everybody to check that out. It's a really a, a blanket organization. They, um, you know, have annual conferences and, and, and you know, help new teams kind of get started and, and uh, provide interpretation of rules to sort of, you know, maintain the vintage aesthetic to clubs that, that have questions on, on, on things. But, um, you know, there are clubs that play by as early as 1845 rules, um, you know, you play to 21, which can be uh, very time consuming if, if the clubs are, are skilled um, and all the way up until, you know, the 1900s, 1895 style where, you're, where you've got the overhand pitches and a lot more strikeouts and uh, definitely a, a, a more challenging for, for the hitter versus the pitch to contact underhand soft toss that, uh, that we're used to seeing in these 1860s games. Um, and that's just kind of the, the 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 text in a nutshell, but it's more than just uh, you know writing. We've got uh, a whole dictionary of vintage baseball jargon. I mean, that's half the fun of this is is speaking like they did back in back in the eighteen sixties. And we'll get into what some of those some of those examples are. Um, there's also a, a, with the permission of um, of uh, Baseball Almanac, uh, we uh, printed a table of rule changes by year from uh, the eighteen forties all the way until the, until nineteen hundred, and so. Um, just very valuable to see how quickly the game adapted because these clubs were really experimenting, um, you know, before we had the, you know, National League in 1876. So they'd have these loose conferences uh, that they'd have every year in New York where they'd kind of, you know, uh, accept and reject rules. So that was kind of part of the experimentation. And so it can be difficult to keep track, especially if you're playing vintage ball by, by different eras. And of course, dozens of photographs, which, um, you know, pictures worth a thousand words, and we'll get into a few of those. Already got into that. So has anybody played vintage baseball or, or, or seen it? I, I guess, I think Thomas, you mentioned, uh, you mentioned uh, seeing it in Chicago. Anybody else? I've seen it live. I've never played it. I've watched, there's, there's this couple teams around Springfield that sure. I've watched play. Been Probably the, uh, the Long uh, Nine and the Long Nine. Yep. Uh, Rock Squirrels or something. I don't know. They played out of Decatur, so. Yep. Yep. And they have a, they have got a great tournament called the uh, Douglas Cup. Yeah. So they're uh they're, uh, they're, they're, they're a very active, active community and uh, they largely play by these 1860s rules, which are, which are the most popular because, um, you know, it's, it's underhand pitch. It's about pitching to contact. So if you recall, there, there was no strike zone back then. So gentlemen's game, right? That's what they always called it. Yeah. Yeah. Gentlemen's game, but certainly, uh, 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 you know, nowadays a ladies and gentlemen's game, you'll see, uh, you know, I cover a whole chapter on an, on an all women's club in Columbus, Ohio, but a lot of these clubs are, 
our co-ed, um, really all about, about all comers. But yeah, it was meant to kind of preserve the, um, the, the, the vintage aesthetic of, of the 1860s. So they take the rules very seriously. They even have fines for, uh, for, for non-compliance, uh, which, you know, fortunately are not pegged to inflation. So, you know, it's uh, usually a quarter or less and they deal with uh, ungentlemanly behaviors like spitting or uh, complaining to the umpire or, uh, or even, uh, you know, um, uh, cursing. So imagine if that would happen in, in today's game, we'd be, uh, we'd be looking at a very different uh, penalty structure and, uh, and, <laughs> and uh, uh, an abundance of fines. But um, some of the, some of the big rules that will take you back are the bound catch out. So, in 1860, there were no gloves. Gloves didn't really become in vogue till till around the 1890s. So um, the ball can be uh, 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 a ball hit, a batted ball can be registered and out if caught on the fly or on a single bounce, uh, which is often the preferred option. But you know, there's there's different combinations. So you know, if there are runners on base and there's you know less than two outs, um, you know, a, a a ball caught on the fly requires a tag up, whereas one of the bounce does not. You'll often see uh, uh, novice vintage baseball players uh, on the base path get tripped up by that. Um, we talked about no strike zones or walks. You know, this is very much meant to be a, a pitch to contact. It's not the the game within the game between the pitcher um, and and the and, and the hitter or the striker as they called them back then. Uh, fair foul, very different. Um, it is not where the ball uh, passes. You know, first and third. It's where it first makes contact. So, um, you know, if you hit a chopper uh, right into the ground, it hits fair territory, and then and then uh, and then curves foul. That's a fair ball. So, um, you know, you can see people kind of exploit that uh, that chop swing. Um, and, uh, you know, they even play obstacles. So I, I recently saw at the, uh, at the St. Louis cup a few weeks back, somebody, uh, hit a foul one back that would have normally hit the, hit the backstop, but in fact, it, uh, caromed off a tree and then landed, uh, in front of home plate. So that was in fact a fair ball, a fair ball. And, uh, the runner, the runner took off cause they were, they were savvy and, and aware of it. So a little bit, a little bit of chaos, but, uh, but all fun. Uh, we talked about no gloves and, uh, no substitutions. That was the authentic rule um, in 1860, unless there were injury or illness. Uh, clearly, the, the modern vintage games will uh, introduce an element of common sense. So um, that's usually been lifted, especially for uh, this club in Arizona that I covered, um, you know, playing in, in, in 90 degree heat and wool uniforms. Um, you know, that, that, that becomes a, uh, a rule of common sense. Um, and then again, beyond just the, 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 the letter of the law and the rules, we have uh, 1860s etiquette, you know, which is you know, simple things like, you know, no swearing, you know, no arguing with the, uh, with, with the single umpire, um, you know, not arguing with uh, the club captain, um, you know, just, just different things like that. So very much a, um, you know, a, a civil and, and refreshing game that, uh, that is uh, very uncommon today, especially in the modern professional level. Now the equipment is also pretty neat. And um, is this, uh, let me, let me see if I can move this because this is probably obstructing everyone's view. Okay, uh, so the vintage ball is kind of halfway between a uh, baseball and a softball. Um, you also see the stitching is perpendicular, not parallel, um, because uh, they called it a lemon peel back then because it resembled a, a scored fruit. Um, and, and the ball clearly did not travel uh, like it does today because it's a, a wound rubber center versus a, a cork center uh, like we see in, in, in Major League Baseball. So you can kind of see some of these differences. Um, also, one of the uh, one of the challenges early on to these vintage revival clubs in the, in the 80s and 90s were um, trying to preserve the vintage aesthetic, but without having, um, you know, without uh, uh, staying in a budget. So some of these handmade balls would, would cost up to up to 40, uh, you know, 40 bucks a piece, which, you know, you could go get an Easton Incredible uh, for for for, you know, five. So, um, you know, some some clubs had to kind of cut corners. Some clubs actually, um, you know, interestingly enough, uh, one of the one of the sustainers of the vintage game was that uh, specs of these of, of these um, uh, uh, vintage balls were actually um, sent to China and uh, and 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 almost uh, you know mass produced over there at uh, at a much lower price, uh, closer to uh, to ten bucks a ball. So um, you know while that's uh, you know maybe not uh, authentic to the 1860s, it was uh, you know at least the ball kind of looked and resembled uh, what, uh, what 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 was used in the uh, in the 1860s. So. All sorts of different, uh, you know, uh, strategies had to be employed to, uh, to, 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 to keep the game uh, uh, at its vintage aesthetic while, while, while staying within, within reason. Uh, but I thought this is just a great shot, kind of seeing the inside and outside of the ball. And the bats, of course, very different. Uh, this one on the top looks like a tree trunk. Uh, I mean, you'll, you'll see uh, there was a club from Memphis uh, a couple weeks ago that had a bat that weighed, I think it was eight pounds versus the uh, two pounds that you see in the major leagues. So uh, not, not, not meant for, um, for, uh, comfort and, uh, and, um, you know, convenience. It was more about, uh, 
you know, just just uh, preserving the aesthetic and, and and whatever they were able to to to, to produce back in the day. Uh, very little limits on 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 bats uh, back then. Um, there there was a rule about uh, two point five inch width limit, but there was no weight or length limits like like we see today in Major League Baseball. So you can see all sorts of variations. Um, and and as as they look, these bats are are much heavier. The one plus, uh, you know, if you think about in Major League Baseball with these, you can see the the, the handles are much thicker. Uh, so you think underhand toss, thick handled bats. Some of these uh, vintage balls might might have the same bat for five, 10 years. Whereas you think about in Major League Baseball, the average, you know, on average, a bat breaks whatever two games or so. Um, and, you know, we all remember the exploding maple bat uh, scandal uh, many years ago. So, you know, this is uh, this is when bats were, were sturdier construction, but they're a heck of a lot harder to swing. Um, and then the uniforms, of course. Um, so these uniforms are, are, are many of them are, are, are period authentic. So we're talking, you know, often wool. Uh, a lot of them will have a, uh, 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 a team logo on the front uh, buttoned on. Um, you know, some of these cost upwards of, of, of $200. Um, you know, some of these clubs will, um, you know, take, a, take an old photo um, and, and, and share it with uh, the, 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 the producer. Um, and, and try to really capture it as, as close as possible. And one of the clubs I talk about later, the Mountain Athletic Club, did exactly that with uh, with uh, one of the um, uh, the Mountain Athletic Club of the, of the 1890s, which was kind of a uh, unaffiliated um, a feeder to the to the Cincinnati Reds. Um, but again, you know, you can imagine we play in the summer. Uh, you got these heavy wool link uniforms. You, you are sweating bullets, um, you know. But that's that's kind of part of the game. So. Um, you know, a lot of, a lot of clubs take, take great pride in that, but occasionally you will see, uh, folks passersby that'll jump in and, you know, they're not barred from playing cause they're wearing shorts and a t-shirt. So, um, you know, don't be shy if you see a game and want to jump in. And then, uh, as I mentioned, terminology, terminology is, uh, you know, one, some of the most fun of, of, of vintage baseball. So some of the more common ones, you know, uh, in, a, a run is often referred to as an ACE or, or a tally, uh, players were often referred to as ballists. Uh, hard hit ball. There's so many different terms, but you know some of my favorites are corkers, wizards, shooters, stingers, uh, a daisy cutter for a sharp grounder. Uh, you know you got to think with the single bounce rule. Uh, the daisy cutter was a very skilled shot to uh, be able to to hit hit something hard and on the ground that's not going to bounce up high um, and, and make for an easy out. So um, you know that's a, 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 a strategic play if you can pull it off. Um, complaining was referred to as kicking or chafing, which you know was often uh, punishable by fine. And you got to keep in mind there there was only one umpire back in the day, so um, you know uh, they they did make quite a few mistakes, especially on uh, distant fair foul rules. Um, so again, mistakes were made, but uh, but but complaining was far less prevalent than it is today. And uh, you know at the end of the game they they say uh, hip hip huzzah, which is just just fun. It's uh, you know uh, it, it has its early roots from, from from England, but it's fun. It just kind of makes you, makes you feel like a kid again. Um, you know, and, but it's, you know, consistently used across the vintage community and, uh, just a lot of fun. Uh, some of these phrases are, 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 are quite fun too. Like, you know, good play is taken handsomely, uh, accepted with quiet acquiescence. It seems almost like a, like a, a euphemism from a, from a George Carlin bit. Uh, but that was actually a, a, a term that was used in print, uh, raises dander, you know, to, to get into it with the umpire, which, uh, you know, we, uh, we saw a good one. Uh, was it last week with uh, Aaron Boone and uh, and uh, was it uh, Ron Culpa or one of the umpires? Uh, he did the uh, he did the uh, the high strike zone uh, bow and arrow and, and got his money worth. But uh, yeah, that would be that that would fall into that category um, and, and and sent to the grass. So, um, any questions before I just get into a handful of the clubs that are covered in the book? So um, this is kind of funny. So this is in Columbus, Ohio, uh, one of the uh, ground zero for, for vintage baseball. You'll see here uh, uh, against the aesthetic is the Goodyear blimp. Uh, it was actually in town, uh, the Ohio Cup, which is the largest vintage baseball tournament in the country, uh, tracks, you know, 30 plus teams. It's been going on for, for, for 30 something years. Um, and it's just a, just a great weekend. It's played on uh, Labor Day weekend. And uh, uh, if you recall last fall, uh, 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 Notre Dame played at Ohio State, and the Goodyear Blimp was there, uh, kind of calibrating, uh, taking some some shots just to uh, to test for the big game. So, uh, kind of a kind of a neat uh, picture that was caught there. You also notice, um, you know, home plate is a, a circular uh, piece of piece of uh, iron versus you know your, your 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 pentagon. So that's kind of interesting as well. Um, you know, there there is a fence here, but most fields do not have a fence. Um, and, you know, you can just kind of see what it, what, what it looks like with the uniforms and, and such, but 
this Ohio program, you know, they've been around since uh, around uh, 1980, 1981, um, and they're named, nicknamed the Muffins, which is a slang 1860s term for a poor player, uh, which I feel could still hold up today, but uh, kind of their uh, whimsical, ironic nickname, but they are, uh, you know, kind of the, the the founding fathers, along with the gentlemen in uh, Long Island of this uh, of this vintage baseball movement that, you know, like I said, began, uh, you know, with, with a couple clubs and is now, you know, blossomed over 400 today. Um, and again, this this club has really um, done done well in the media circuit, being in all the major media outlets, and even getting some ink in uh, in a Japanese magazine. So, um, in a baseball crazy country, why not? Um, and again, you know, they 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 don't they're not limited to just playing at uh, Ohio Village or, or or different city parks. They played at Dyersville Field of Dreams, and um, even before some some MLB games. So, um, you know, they will uh, they're great ambassadors of the game, and they will play uh, they will play anywhere. Um, you know, won't get into the details of every single club. I'll just point out a couple of a uh, couple of fun uh, facts here. So, the Mountain Athletic Club. If anybody is familiar with uh, Fleischman's New York, small village of um, just a couple hundred folks, um, probably about a uh, two plus hour drive north of uh, of, of Manhattan. Um, but again, it's in the uh, Catskill Mountains. You know, beautiful area up there, uh, rich in history. Uh, not far from uh, from Cooperstown. They play by the 1890s rules, uh, which is overhand pitch, and uh, they're very competitive. Uh, there's there's actually uh, three or four clubs up there in Delaware County, uh, New York, that play by this. And um, you know they've they've had some incredible athletes play, um, including a, a former uh, high A pitcher for the Minnesota Twins, um, and uh, a gentleman who uh, actually managed the uh, Israeli national team and Nate Fish and played college ball with Nate Euclid. So um, you know a lot a lot of skill represented, but they also accept all comers. But um, you know, they are uh, very, very um, attuned to, to the history of their club, um, which, you know, the, the city of Fleischmann's is named after Fleischmann's family. Uh, they are the uh, uh, yeast magnet that you probably see their packets of yeast at the store or have had Fleischmann's gin or margarine. Uh, that, that, that is them. And they were uh, they were very affluent. And uh, their, their two sons, uh, Joyce and Max, um, uh, when, when they settled uh, in, the, in their summer resort in, uh, in this town, uh, which was named uh, Griffin Corners at the time. Uh, they started a baseball club, and uh, with their baseball club, they uh, were able to uh, to attract uh, a lot of good talent from the college and uh, even minor league ranks, and uh, put together a, a pretty remarkable semi-pro club that has uh, quite a few uh, amazing alumni, which I'll get into. And in, in, oh, well, I guess I steal my thunder here a little bit, but uh, you know, Miller James Huggins, uh, you know, Hall of Famer. Um, uh, I believe he's a Hall of Fame manager with the uh, with the Yankees, um, and then you have uh, Charlie Red Duin, who is a um, uh, a marathon catcher. Uh, he had the Cincinnati or sorry, the Philadelphia Phillies uh, record for uh, most games caught until, uh, until uh, uh, Mike Lieberthal uh, broke that. Um, George Whitey Rohe was a um, um, world series hero for the, uh, for the Chicago White Sox um, in, in, uh, in, in, in 1906 um, and, and possibly Hannes Wagner. And I'll, I'll get into that in, in a bit. Any, any questions or, 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 or thoughts? All right, um, the Akron Black Stockings, who are featured on the on the cover of the book, uh, pretty pretty fascinating here. So they play at uh, Stan Hewitt Hall and Gardens, which is uh, in in Northwest Akron, and this house belonged to the Sieberling family of the Goodyear Tires fame. So they had more money than they knew what to do with. But uh, when when Frank the Patriarch passed away, um, the family's motto is is Latin non nobis solum, not for us alone. So when he passed away, they donated it to the city, and it's now this incredible conservatory and park. Um, and, and, and the Black Stockings, one of the uh, uh, forefathers of vintage baseball play there. Um, they have an incredible event every year called the Akron Cup. Um, and, and again, loosely based on the 1869 Cincinnati Red Stockings, who we all know is the first openly all professional team with their whopping $9,000 payroll um, and, and 57 no record. And, you know, once professionalism was legalized in 1869 and, and the Red Stockings did what they did, um, you know, the rest is history. Baseball became a professional game. Um, but it is it is fascinating. They they are um, you know they they model themselves after the uh, Cincinnati Red Stockings of 1869. And in the book, we actually compare and contrast the 2021 Black Stocking stats to the Red Stockings. Now, keep in mind we're talking apples and oranges here because the Red Stockings were playing um, a lot of professional clubs across the country, whereas they're playing you know weekend warriors. Uh, but it is pretty fascinating to kind of see where they where they compare and contrast and. Just the fact that we can bridge, you know, 150 years of 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 of, of, of data together is is pretty remarkable. Because, you know, if you uh, spend a lot of time on uh, 
on Baseball Almanac or um, uh, Baseball Reference. There's not a lot of data on the uh, on the Pioneer era. So, um, you know, some gentlemen that uh, wrote a book on the Red Stockings helped with that. So uh, appreciative of them for that. And then uh, I mentioned the Lafayette Square Cycle, and this this club really helped uh, introduce me to the game. I was actually living in the neighborhood, stumbled upon these these gentlemen playing the game. Um, a little confused at what I was seeing, you know, they were, they were an inning ended on a, on a bound catch out. And I was like, you know, is this just a, a bad missed call? But, uh, this gentleman, uh, uh, since passed, uh, Jonathan, Charlie Brown Ferris, you'll notice all these players have, have nicknames. It's kind of part of a, a rite of passage of being a vintage ballist. Um, often the nicknames have something to do with their profession, like, um, you know, moonshine, uh, he, he's a, he's a, a, a liquor distributor. Uh, you know, Shakespeare is an actor, uh, Little Egypt, uh, Dr. Dr. Deborah Little Egypt Reed, uh, who's a legend in the vintage baseball community and a, um, a, a, universe, a retired university professor. She's actually nicknamed Little Egypt because she's from Southern Illinois, which <laughs> unbeknownst to me when I, uh, when, when I did this research was, was a nickname for the region because of uh, the abundance of grain and the, um, and the um, uh, Native American mounds that, uh, that, that resembled uh, pyramids. So I um, thought that was pretty, pretty fascinating. Um, and again, you know, so the cyclone we talked about are, are modeled after uh, uh, the first, you know, technically organized club, Western Mississippi and the, uh, and the cyclones, uh, who tragically only played for one year before the Civil War uh, really broke that up. And, you know, unfortunately, there were St. Louis was a fiercely divided city during the Civil War. And uh, teammates from that club actually were on opposite ends of the battlefield at uh, Vicksburg. They were both um, aide de camps um, of, uh, I believe, General Bowen and, and, and General um, um, uh, Grant, I believe, but um, basically, you know, they were not, uh, you know, they didn't actually fight, but uh, it was just kind of uh, very telling of of how divisive the war was that, especially in a city like St. Louis, where, um, you know, folks were divided, but, you know, baseball teams themselves were divided right down the middle. So, you know, um, you know, very, very tragic point in our history, but also uh, baseball was such an important role in, um, you know, galvanizing the the nation after the war and and, and helping folks heal and just, Giving veterans a welcome distraction from uh, from uh, you know the, the 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 terrors that they experienced. So um, you know, baseball became the national pastime because of its you know therapeutic qualities, as as, as, as many of you have read about. Um, also mentioned just the Ohio Village Diamonds. Uh, you, you mentioned here they they are um, you know just truly remarkable. They um, they're an all women's club. They play in authentic country field dresses. Think like Laura Ingalls Wilder and in, in, uh, a Little House in the Prairie. Um, and, and you know it's 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 truly remarkable. They um, they've been going strong since the early '90s. Uh, they pass it down from mother to daughter. Um, they have you know college students. They have senior citizens. Um, and they've really been an inspiration. They've they've um, you know, tried to spread the game, you know, women's vintage women's baseball has had some success in Michigan, even as far as Colorado, but a lot of those clubs have come and gone. So they've really been the, uh, the torchbearer and, uh, have really helped clubs kind of uh, get started and been a great ambassador for, for, for women in sport. And they're, and they're nicknamed the diamonds because, you know, when women have been playing, you know, baseball as long as, as long as men, and, uh, it's just been largely out of the public eye. And so they were called diamonds in the rough because they were, you know, playing great baseball kind of outside of, uh, outside of the media. Um, cause clearly the, 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 the bias of the media in the 1860s. And then again, the, the game is not just, uh, you know, predominantly in the Midwest and in, 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 uh, um, uh, New York, but, uh, we, we, we have seen some, some good traction out West. Um, you know, there's a club, uh, in, 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 in Arizona, um, there's a whole league, um, in, in, in Arizona, they used to be the Arizona territories, vintage baseball league. Um, and, you know, quite a few clubs from, from Northern Arizona and the Phoenix area. Um, so, you know, they're, you know, they played ball, um, in, in the 1860s and 70s there. So they're, they're reconnecting that, but just goes to show kind of how, um, you know, how nationwide th this is and how, you know, the game, you know the vintage game while while it's spreading to the west coast more recently um you know baseball has been 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 strong and on the west coast since the uh since the civil war and so they're kind of rekindling that uh with some of these some of these clubs um and so that's kind of the, the clubs in a nutshell um unless anybody has questions i thought i'd get into a uh, a little more about this mountain athletic club because it's a pretty fascinating uh, a bit of a mount rushmore of sorts this photo how many uh players would you say there are across the country you know, the, the, the average count per club really varies. Um, you know, some of the clubs like, like the Ohio village muffin muffins have, you know, um, they've had upwards of, you know, hundred members on their club, but some of these clubs wow. are playing by the skin of their teeth, you know, they, mm -hmm. they, they often don't have, you know, nine players. So they'll, 
um, you know, ask the other side to, to lend some support, although they'll, they'll grab uh, volunteers from, from the local area. So, you know, I'd say, you know, on average, if you take, you know, 400 clubs at about, you know, 10 folks per team, you know, you're, you're kind of in that, uh, you know, 4,000 players or so. Mm. Um, interesting fact here before I turn the page though, is, uh, so this four Verde Excelsior's club, they, uh, one of the, um, uh, actually one of the players on, on their opponent, the, um, Prescott champions who were named after one of the, the, the first, um, you know, dominant clubs in the Arizona territories. Um, one of the, uh, a father son, uh, uh, teammates, um, happened to know the late Dodger legend, Maury Wills. He, he, he lived in their neighborhood and, uh, they invited him to come to the game and he sure enough came out and, uh, roped a single and, uh, and, and joined in and signed autographs afterwards. So, um, you know, that was, uh, cool to have, uh, to have a, a legend go out and, and, and do that. So, um, you know, just, uh, you know, the, the, the game, the game is not devoid of, uh, celebrity cameos. So this mountain athletic club, this photo, which is in the book, um, really a, uh, really a Mount Rushmore of sorts looks pretty nondescript. Does anybody, uh, without reading the, uh, the, the page here, does anybody recognize any of those faces? Probably not. So again, the Mountain Athletic Club, you know, founded in the 1890s by these two uh, uh, yeast uh, heirs, uh, Julius and Max Fleischman. Basically, just they were in their 20s. Their dad still ran the business. They were they were having fun, um, you know. But uh, you know, they invited their friends from from the factories because uh, you know they had a, they had a large yeast factory nearby in Peekskill, New York. Uh, invited their friends, uh, but things really changed for that family when uh, when uh, their, their their father uh, passed and and and. Uh, um, uh, uh, Julius became the um, the, uh, the 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 patriarch of the uh, of, of the East uh, enterprise, um, and that was enough for him. He actually uh, ran for mayor and won uh, uh, in Cincinnati. So he was mayor of Cincinnati in 1900. Um, you know, CEO of the of the the world's largest commercial yeast producer. Um, oh yeah, and his brother and him uh, got in on uh, uh, on purchasing the Cincinnati Reds. So you're owning a major league team. You're a CEO of a major company, and you're uh, and, and you're a mayor. So. He got busy. Uh, he kind of took a took a back seat. Uh, his, his brother, uh, his brother Max, continued to kind of help manage the club. But you know, being the owner of the Reds, uh, there this this little uh, semi pro club uh, that they had uh, at their summer home kind of became a, 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 a center of attention for a lot of folks, a lot of up and comers who wanted to uh, to get noticed by uh, by by uh, MLB owners. Uh, also, kind of a uh, uh, kind of an unofficial minor league, uh, as we'll see here. Uh, from this from this photo, so um, you know this this nondescript semi pro club in the in the mountains of New York, um, you know, was, was very very important historically, um, and and was uh, uh, held host to, uh, to 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 many great names in, in baseball. Um, special thanks to Colin Miller; he's a fellow Saber member in 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 Central New York, uh, because he really dug this information up on his blog. Um, so we'll point to the first gut gentleman here, Peak Skill Peak Cregan. So. Um, you know, just a, just a factory worker at the East factory, you know, recruited by his manager, uh, who you'll see in the center row to the right, uh, to, to help this kind of, uh, fledgling club, um, cause, cause her, he was a, a good player. Um, you know, he actually, uh, parlayed this, this gig into, uh, into, a, a brief appearance with, in the majors. Um, you know, you, you think about in the movie, uh, um, you know, uh, Field of Dreams and Moonlight Graham, you know, going out there for, for, for one inning, uh, he went out there at the New York Giants for one game, went over two with a strikeout. Uh, he did come back though, and uh, did get that elusive first hit, uh, but uh, you know, well below the Mendoza line in his uh, short stint with the Reds. Um, so again, you know, his major league stats are nothing to write home about, but uh, you know, he did he did do some damage in the minor leagues, including uh, going deep on uh, on inaugural Hall of Fame pitcher Chrissy Matthewson, who uh, I'm sure you're all quite familiar with. So um, you know, that's uh, just uh, j just 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 a, a story that not many of us can 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 tell ourselves. Harry Stevens, you know, you can tell from looking at him, doesn't look like much of an athlete. Um, I always thought he kind of looked like uh, the actor uh, Michael Sarah from the Superbad movie. But, uh, you know, he was the club manager, uh, you know, baseball, playing baseball was not his strong suit, but uh, administering it was. So uh, uh, you may have heard of uh, the uh, the uh, acquiring company of his concession company, Aramark. Um, and, and he really shifted, uh, you know, traditional ballpark fare to, uh, you know, think of the old kind of World's Fair uh, you know, of ice cream and lemonade fair to, uh, you know, more of the, what we, what we see today with peanuts and, and soda and, and, and the like. Um, and also of course the hot dog, uh, largely, um, kind of credited with introducing that to the ballpark experience. So, uh, 
you know, that, uh, that nondescript gentleman over there, uh, became a, a concessions tycoon that, uh, we still, uh, we still appreciate his legacy today. Jack, in your research, sure. um, I have not come across, uh, in all the books I've read similar to yours, um, of when they started selling alcohol and beer, particularly games. And I would think that maybe St. Louis might have been one because of the brewery connection there. But um, I, I've rarely read and said like, well, as of this date, like these clubs in the major leagues were finally selling alcohol and things like that. Obviously, they weren't doing prohibition. Have you ever come, come across anything like that? Yeah, a little bit. I, 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 I crossed into that a little bit when in part one when I was doing doing the research. Um, so if you recall, so, um, you know, the National League started in 1876 and that was uh you know, William Hallberg of Chicago uh, White mm -hmm. Stock, now the Cubs, and uh, straight as an arrow, um, you know, uh, 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 beer sales were, 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 you know, largely, largely prohibited. Um, and then so you had this rival league. So they, um, you know, I think it was in 1881, they formed the American Association, the Cincinnati, they basically booted the Cincinnati Reds because the dissenting vote, their uh, uh, club president, W.H. Kennett, voted against it because, you um, Oh, sorry, sorry. Let, let me let me backtrack a little bit. So, um, in by 1881, they had a prohibition of, of 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 beer sales in the ballpark, and they asked all the clubs to sign. Um, w. H. Kennett of the Cincinnati Reds was the lone dissenting vote, um, so they effectively abolished him from the league. He then the Cincinnati Red Stockings then. Um, I I got to get my years right. So so Kennett Kennett the Reds were kicked out in in the late 1870s. They went on a couple year hiatus. In 1881, the Reds were resurfaced uh, with uh, Justice Justice Thorner and O.P. Kaler, I believe, and uh, they got together with uh, some other like-minded clubs, including the St. Louis Browns and Chris Fondera, and they formed the American Association, which I think began in 1881. And one of their first core founding principles was uh, uh, alcohol sales in the ballpark and Sunday baseball. Uh, oh, because, that's right. Yeah, the, is that the beer and whiskey league? The beer and whiskey league. Yeah. Sorry, I'm yeah. like, I'm kind of like. I'm kind of uh, blurring the lines between 1878 and 1881, but, you know, splitting hairs. But, um, you know, there's quite a bit written in, in, in uh, um, uh, J. Thomas Hetrick's book on Chris Fondera and the St. Louis Browns um, and another great book by Ed Acorn, uh, Summer Beer and Whiskey, which I strongly recommend. Um, but anyway, um, so, yeah, so, so then that, that Beer and Whiskey League kind of ran parallel to, uh, to the National League. Um, eventually the National League was able to poach back a couple clubs in Cincinnati um, a few years later uh, by allowing them to continue the, the, the alcohol sales. Um, and eventually the, uh, the American Association folded around, uh, around 1890. And then the American League, as we know, it didn't, didn't resurface until 1901. Um, and then of course, the, the granddaddy of them all, this gentleman in the back right, uh, we don't know this for a fact. The the Hall of Fame issued a proclamation acknowledging it. Uh, we all know that's not uh, that's not set in stone, but uh, there is a lot of prevailing evidence um, from this photograph, from uh, some you know uh, comparison to other verified images of Hannes Wagner that this could in fact have been Hannes. And really, the 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 hypothesis of this was that this photo from uh, 1895 was uh, donated by um, a former postmaster of Fleischmann's. Um, it was donated to a newspaper in uh, the 1960s and was printed there. Um, and this postmaster uh, from his childhood um, uh, had this photo and, 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 and asserted that this was, in fact, Hannes Wagner, um, who, who, you know, if, you, if you've read a little bit about Hannes Wagner, um, you know, he uh, got on to a, 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 the Patterson Silk Weavers in 1896, and they were a legitimate uh, minor league club. And then, of course, you know, signed with the Louisville Colonels and the rest is history. Uh, but in that summer of 1895, he's believed to have played on at least five different clubs. So you had all these semi-pro leagues um, in Pennsylvania, Ohio, uh, New York, and so forth that were just fly by night. Uh, you know, they would they they would they would go insolvent. Um, you know, baseball was popular, but nobody had the money to support it. So Hannes just you know continued to 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 bounce from club to club, and and it's believed that he uh, he made a cameo with this Mountain Athletic Club because of the. Um, prestige of of of, of their uh, of of the namesake family, the uh, the, the Fleischmans. Um, but again, you know, it's like 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 all baseball myths in the uh, 19th century. There's a little bit of uh, ambiguity there, and uh, you know, people continue to investigate, and uh, you know, the the mystery helps helps keep it interesting and adds the intrigue. But you know, uh, Hannes Wagner's career is 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 not up for debate. I mean, you just look at some of these mind blowing statistics. Um, you know, the the 700 steals. I mean. 
131 war. I know it's hard to go back and, and recalculate that. Uh, but, you know, I mean, being a Cardinals fan, the greatest player I've, I've been able to watch in, in my lifetime was Albert Pujols and he's at about a hundred. So um, just, just, just really puts it in perspective and the eight batting titles and, you know, the fact that people are paying $7 million a pop for his card is, is, is unbelievable. And, you know, uh, regardless of whether that's him in the photo, um, you know, I think it's, 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 you know, just an incredible piece of, of Fleischman's history in their, in their past. And, you know, there's a lot of evidence to suggest that that is in fact him. Any uh, questions or thoughts? So I know I uh, talked a lot, but, um, you know, uh, really appreciate it. You know, I could talk about this stuff for, for, for days. This is, uh, this is, this is a passion. And, uh, you know, I know uh, I'm talking to fellow baseball historians, so I'm preaching the choir here, but, uh, you know, a lot of folks, um, a lot of folks, um, you know, go from, you know, the dead ball era and on. So this pioneer era is, is, is a very, you know, uh, it's, it's a hidden gem and, um, you know, it's, uh, it's, it, it you know, you can read about it and, and hear about it, but uh, to see these folks trying to preserve it um, in, 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 the, in these vintage baseball leagues is uh, just taking it to another level and, and, and living history. So I encourage everybody to to check it out, at least at least watch it. And don't be shy, um, you know, uh, talk to the folks. That's what they're there for. And, uh, you know, if you want to get in there and, and take a swing, they'd be glad to, to, to do it because uh, that's what happened to me. I got hooked. So, um, you know, certainly encourage you all to, uh, to, to explore it if you, if you have teams in your area. Jack, uh, I assume with looking back to the history, uh, Robert Sampson, a retired history professor, recently came out with a book on uh, early Illinois baseball teams. Ballas, and I'm trying to remember the whole thing. I've got his book. I've, had you seen that book before or were aware of it it just came yes. the thing is the timing of your i i he I, I got in touch with him and spoke with him while he was finishing it and uh, he came and met with us when we were in bloomington i believe not too long ago <laughs> and uh but the timing was the timing was not perfect for your book and and his as far as coming across directions there but have you talked to robert or seen him yeah, Bob. Bob is a Bob. Bob is a legend. He uh, he he actually helped me get started. Uh, when, oh, great. When, when I started reaching out to the clubs, um, I started with the Vintage Baseball Association. I'm like, you know, why don't I start from the top, and then they're going to tell me who I need to talk to. Mm -hmm. uh, so Bob, Bob is the historian. Uh, he was manning the VBA email. He said, okay, you need to read this book from uh, Peter Morris. But didn't we have fun mm -hmm. about the pioneer era? He said you need to read uh, Jim Tootle's book, which is you know, really um, another book on vintage baseball that was published um, uh, over a decade ago through uh, McFarland and uh, mm -hmm. not, not a competing work. That is more of a, uh, you know, encyclopedia of all things vintage baseball. So I encourage you to check that out too. It's called uh, Recapturing America's, I have it right here. It's called uh, Vintage Baseball Recapturing America's Pastime by, by James Tootle, uh, who is a mm -hmm. professor at Ohio State. So another really comprehensive book if you're into more of the nuts and bolts of vintage baseball. Mine's a little more of the history, human interest piece, and kind of a deep dive into, into a handful of the clubs. Uh, but anyway, Bob was fantastic, very supportive of the book. He actually wrote a, about a page review uh, that was published in the Vintage Baseball Newsletter recently, um, and it's on the site, pocopress.com, um, uh, so you can, you can read as well. So uh, yeah, Bob was uh, just an incredible resource. And uh, yeah, I'm not sure, I, believe, does he, he, I think he plays with uh, the, uh, the Rock, uh, Rock Springs Club, the, uh, the, the Rock mm -hmm. Springs schools or the uh springfield long nights they actually played together at the uh, uh st louis tournament they were called the spring Cater club so um mm -hmm. I, I don't know if they were just merging for that for that game or not they generally uh, play because the area if i could chime in on that as well bob is he is presenting monday night in the break chapter right yes yes yeah yes, st louis and yeah. i actually if you can you probably can't make this out but i actually have two papers he sent me after that he was here in 2019 i think right before uh right before um covid and so yep. this is the other one he sent me so he's yep. and he's retired he did he was like a, what would be something at Melican. he was a professor like uh mm -hmm. you know adjunct professor or whatever but yeah he i've talked to him this week actually on facebook he's gonna be he's doing a zoom though he won't be at the i'm actually gonna go down to the meeting on monday night because they do a book auction but he's gonna be the presenter so yeah yeah, he's a fascinating guy yeah. to talk to, and he was very helpful to me in the beginning. Uh, it was one of the first teams we had here in Monmouth was a team called the Clippers, and sure. I did a lot of research on them. And uh, from some of the things he'd found at the same time, 
believe that they were one of the junior clubs, so made up of some of the younger ones. Uh, uh, but it was fascinating. They they went up and played the uh, the Forest City, uh, or am I trying to think? Losing my chunks on the Rockford Forest City. Rockford Forest City. Yeah, yeah, that was that was a legendary club. Yeah, of, uh, yeah. Of they got beat seventy six to one, so that gives you an idea. They thought they were pretty good. They and they did beat some really good clubs, but uh, but. Yeah, I they played a team that was made of some guys that have been the former um, Chicago Excelsiors and did halfway decent against them, but but Rockford just absolutely. Oh, and then Rockford came down later that year after they beat them seventy six to one. They came down to Monmouth to play and they beat Monmouth here. They let up on them a little bit. They only beat them fifty four to two. Wow. So, uh, <laughs> well, the hero, the, the, the local news, the newspaper talked about the hero of the game was the guy who'd scored the extra run. So. <laughs> well, they, they can at least claim to fame that they're the club they're inspired by the rock and four cities were one of the mm -hmm. few clubs that almost beat the uh, 1869 since that's right in there yeah. Uh, yeah it was them and uh and the troy yeah. haymakers um who yeah. they they got in a fist fight and walked off and it was ruled a forfeit but uh those are the only teams that came close everybody else was you know just uh, a, yeah. a knife a knife to a gunfight um well, I, well we're I was oh, going to say, we're trying to find the location of where that ballpark likely was. It's called the North Prairie. And we think we've kind of got it narrowed down somewhat of where it was. And it may have been in the area where the president of Monmouth College home, and there's a cemetery that's north of there. And that area is one of the fairly flat areas that was north of the college campus. And so we think that's where they played. But we, we've never been able to find it on a map. And, and for a long time, they would just say, they played at the park or something like that. Well, that really narrows it down, doesn't it? So, right. so until until they got a uh, they started playing at a, the fairgrounds uh, in like the eighteen seventies, eighteen eighties. We really don't know where they played up until that point in time. Yeah, yeah. I was just pulling up the Rockford uh, Forest City score. They yeah. uh, they, uh, they 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 took it on the chin a few times, but I think that yeah. they, I think there was one game where it was like by one run. Um, I, I have all the I have all the results posted here. I was just double checking, but that's neither here nor there. Um, and I do apologize. I missed uh, some of the stuff in the chat. I think I was just full screen and I, I'm down to one monitor today. But um, I did see a question about the bats. Uh, the one about the circular ring. Yeah, I can pull that back up real quick. Um, so I'll go ahead and share. But that uh, the one on the bottom with the split grip, that's actually a, a Nap LaJoy style bat that, that didn't become in vogue till uh, till the, uh, um, you know, kind of the turn of the century. Um, you know, uh, but yeah, that, uh, they play by different eras. Some of these vintage clubs will experiment and do 1890s stuff or they'll even do some early dead ball stuff. So that's kind of his, his, his gamut. Thanks. Yep. Um, and then, yeah, I think that was, I think those were all the, uh, the main questions there, but, you know, like I said, it's, uh, it was, it was being a relative outsider to vintage baseball, they just welcome me with open arms. You know, you, you reach out to these clubs. They all have, you know, some of them have, you know, good records and blogs and Facebook pages. Some of them just kind of play and, and and that's it. But uh, just just how open people all wanted to share, you know, it was, uh, can you imagine if I tried to write a book on, on Major League Baseball, they'd say, well, let me see your ESPN pass, you know. So <laughs> these are just weekend warriors that just poured out their soul. So I, I just thought it was just spoke to volumes of, you know, the tight-knit community that vintage baseball is. Jack, I'm curious. I couldn't find the raise my hand button on here. Sorry, but um, I'm curious. What was your total investment on time doing the research for this book? If you said that earlier, I missed it. Yeah, no, I mean, it was probably a two-year journey from idea okay. to, um, I mean, keep in mind, yeah, I had full-time job and two kids under seven. So <laughs> it, started, right. it started kind of as a, uh, you know, pandemic hobby idea. You know, I've, I've done like, you know, uh, I've written articles and stuff. I mean, I practice in finance and, and accounting. So, you know, I, I do stuff for trade journals, but I'm like, you know, I've, I've always wanted to write a book. And I guess, you know, the introspection of COVID and, and, and the people finding hobbies kind of, you know, challenged me to, 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 to take another crack at it. But you know, again, when you're just, you know, working a full-time job and you're just, you know, plugging away at night, uh, you know, you just chip away a little bit, you know, and it's, it's tough to get to 75,000 words, you know, there are some nights when you get 50 and some nights when you get 1500. So. <laughs> well, don't beat yourself up. You, uh, you, you invested that time during COVID instead of spending thousands of dollars on bobbleheads like I did. So I think your method was best. <laughs> yeah. Well, you got, you, you know, you got a lot to show for it. I just have, uh, I, I just have this, this little thing. So. Yeah. <laughs>
but uh yeah i mean i, I think uh you know i think uh um you know there 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 will be another book eventually but uh you know whether it's in vintage baseball or a more in-depth 19th century topic but i i think i'm a 19th century baseball guy i just uh you know there's there's there, there's there's too much uh there's too much gold to dig up <laughs> Well, I just wanted to say uh, thank you for everything tonight. I uh, ordered your book real quickly when we got started because I wanted to make sure I could find it. So I'll be fascinated to hopefully arrive within a week or so here and get a chance to uh, to read through it. So thank yeah, you so no, much. I, I, I appreciate I it. Hope you enjoy it. And, uh, you know, oh, I, think, yes. uh, I think- Is there that, an ebook option I didn't look yet? There, there is, there is. Okay. There, uh, if you go in- Amazon, I divest myself of so many books to declutter and like I'm taking up, that's why I'm going to St. Louis on Monday because they have a- a book auction every fall that benefits the chapter. So I'm taking a bunch of books down there, but want to make sure I can buy this one electronically. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. There's, uh, the only Thank thing, you. if you're, if you're, if you're for some reason ordering like, you know, multiple copies, the shipping for paperbacks is cheaper. If you order on pocopress.com, okay. which is P O C O L press.com. I think he, I think it's like per order versus um, per, per unit, but you know, okay. nice problem to have, but uh, otherwise, yeah, there's an ebook on Amazon or paperback on Amazon. Uh, no, no audiobooks, Unfortunately, I, uh, I don't think anybody would want to listen to me read uh, 75,000 words. <laughs> couldn't find, uh, could, could, couldn't find, uh, you know, George will or somebody to read it for me. <laughs> So, yeah, that was, you know, uh, Ryan, that was really all I had. Uh, but if folks want to reach out, uh, I think uh, you have my email address. Uh, feel free to share it. And, uh, yeah, happy okay. to talk ball, ball with anybody. I can stick around for a few minutes or, uh, you know, just appreciate everybody taking the time and, uh, and listen to me ramble. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was great. Thank you for joining us. Really appreciate it. A quick announcement to everyone. We just today set up a trip to the period chiefs before the end of the season. So I'll be posting it online tomorrow, but uh, Saturday, September 9th, Chiefs game, $12, 6.35 p.m. So again, we'll, uh, we'll all be going to the Chiefs game if you're available. Hope to see you there. Oh, Saturday the 9th, you're saying? Saturday, September 9th. Uh, unfortunately, we're going out to New England. I, I will be in Ohio on the 9th, so I'm sorry I'm going to miss that. Next time. Yep. Actually, we're short on time, which is why we got to squeeze this one in because that's the yeah. last weekend for single A baseball. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Are the, well, thank are you the Chiefs, so much. Yeah, thank you. Are the Chiefs any doing any better than their uh, than their uh, uh, big club? <laughs> <Parent> club. <laughs> uh, I think a little bit, but not a lot. Yeah, my 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 recommendation that that nobody because the Cardinals are you know not big spenders. I said let's just empty the farm system. Let's just see what we got. But uh, mm -hmm. you know they're they're not going to do that. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you everyone. Thanks for joining us. Appreciate it. Thank yep. you, Jack. Thanks for organizing. Thank you all have a great night. No problem. If anyone wants to buy the book, the link is on the Facebook page and Twitter, so you can get it there. All right. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Thank you. Have a good night. Great. Thank you.